Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. This show is all about showcasing entrepreneurs who are building businesses in this exciting part of the world. From reading high-level articles about the region, it can be difficult to really understand what's going on. And so my hope is that these interviews somewhat bring it to life, as well as soaking your curiosity to go find out more. On that, do take a look in the archive for more episodes that we've done. But for now, let's enjoy the rest of this funky intro music and then get started with the show. There are certain business models or concepts which seem to be universally popular. One big one recently has been creating a public space where friends can meet up for some food and drinks and play board games. In this episode, I speak with Sumit Doria, who a few years ago had the realisation that Kenya was missing such an institution. And so, along with five friends, decided he would start one. Two years later, and Baobox is a great success. There are over 100 board games on offer at their board game cafe, and the business can attract custom throughout the day compared to other places that are concentrated solely on after-work drinks and dinner in the evenings. We talk about the costs and practicalities of getting the cafe set up, how they source their games from board game dealers operating in Kenya, and how his staff are paid to play board games in their downtime, as many never grew up playing them. It's a really interesting episode that, to me at least, highlights how different types of businesses can survive and thrive in this part of the world. For more information on where you can find Baobox if you're ever travelling through Nairobi, then be sure to check out the show notes at www.theeastafricabusinesspodcast.com. Anyway, without any further ado, here is Sumit. Cool. So we're here today with Sumit from Bellbox. Sumit, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so to get us started, could you tell us a bit about you and a bit about Bellbox? So yeah, a bit about me. Uh, my childhood involved a lot of, um, I like to believe a lot of outdoor activities and all, and uh, in terms of education, always enjoyed mathematics as a subject. Uh, I, did, I did make sure I took it further to university as well, where I studied Master Economics uh, at Loughborough University in the UK. And then, just like everyone else, did not use that knowledge from the degree ever again. So after uni, I left the UK, came back to Kenya, joined the family business. We do plastics manufacturing. So was part of that business, I guess, learned how trade is done in Nairobi, in a way. And uh, two years back, uh, a random conversation with a friend of mine uh, led to the creation of Bowbox. Now, of course, I guess uh, with this friend of mine, we've had, um, we discussed many a times about how generations have changed or how the bringing of generations has changed in Nairobi. And this time we were talking about a whole generation of Nairobians where they were only exposed to food, alcohol and shisha. Mm -hmm. And we felt it was such a shame because when we were being brought up in the same Nairobi, we were exposed to a lot more outdoor activities, a lot more activities that promoted socializing, that promoted a different kind of bonding with friends. So this same conversation led to my friend asking me, uh, do you think a board game cafe can work in Nairobi? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, from that point, uh, I said, why not? Uh, we can't be the only ones who think that Nairobi needs something more from your evening out or time out with friends that doesn't just involve food and alcohol. It needs something more. It's not the entertainment only. It's just that fulfillment from your time out. Mm -hmm. And that was the birth of Bow Box as an idea. Then from that, luckily, speaking to the right people at the right time. Uh, February was the inception of the idea. And so this, this is February 2017. 2017, yes. yes. And by December 2017, we managed to open the place. So Bow Box is, Bow Box is a board game cafe. Is it Nairobi's only board board game cafe, I guess Kenya's only? So we are lucky enough to have the claim of being East Africa's premier board game cafe. So again, it's a shocker that no one else, and we are grateful, I guess, at the same time uh, so perplexed that why hasn't this been questioned by someone else before mm -hmm. about 
um, creating a space where people can do more than just eat and drink. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you've, um, so you've, other than university, you've lived in Nairobi. Yes. Life. Yeah. Okay. Grew up in Nairobi. Went to the UK for the uni- um, for the higher education. Finished that. Back here. Yeah. Okay. Have you, or before starting Bowbox, had you ever been to a board game cafe? No. Really? No. Never. Never. Uh, never knew what it would look like. Never knew what is expected. Never knew how it would be run. Just. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, how how did you figure it out? So as I said meeting right people at the right time is of course a big help. Um, and a lot of so uh, um, so we are six partners in this. Six of you. Six of us. Yes. E- e- equal partners. Uh, or plus you know, like partners, in terms yeah. of people more yeah. or less put in the same. Yeah, in <laughs> terms of effort and all, uh, in terms of what we bring to the table, it's quite different. I think that's what helps. Mm-hmm. And um, so, in terms of from inception to actually creating a place and opening and running. It really helped to have six friends as well, so five other friends of mine, and it's in a way at the same time people advise against opening a business with friends, but these are friends I knew I can work with, mm-hmm. so that made it slightly easier to get confidence uh, to kick off the idea, and uh, everyone brought something very different to the table. <laughs> True to the word that when it comes to board games, perhaps there's a personality of uh, associated people who play board games to well, being inversely um, apt with technology. Mm-hmm. And that's where I fall. So technology was never my strong point or the other friend who I had this conversation with. So we have another partner who is very good with technology. Mm-hmm. Someone else who is very good with technical um, systems and all that. What, what, what technology? do you need to run a board game cafe? Well, uh, I mean in terms of even social media. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that itself to me is part of technology. I see, okay. Yeah, it's a very, to me technology is a lot, it's a broad um, mm-hmm. spectrum. In terms of software technology, then I have another friend who is very technically able and understands um, back-end systems very well. Mm-hmm. So he normally handles that aspect of the business, but at the same time in terms of setup, that, that ability of his really helped us in terms of choosing the right POS system, in terms of making sure that that POS system links to... P- P- POS is point of sale. Point of sale like system, where people, sorry, we should where, yeah. Basically the, the cash register. The yeah, so to speak, pay. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the cash register of the business. The, but it's, it's a lot more than that. It's for the waiters, it's a point of entry in terms of orders, but which also defines them order per table. Mm-hmm. At the back end, it also allows us to link our sales to the consumption of um, raw materials as well. Mm-hmm. So the system does links the sale to the usage as well, and you can input uh, your buying, your purchasing as well, and also it's, it's a good guidance in terms of your position as, a, well, as an establishment. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so we'll sort of talk about a few of those, um, <clears throat> a few of the different um, aspects. But um, just to sort of paint a picture, mm-hmm. Bowbox, can you sort of explain? So it's in Westlands in Nairobi. How would you describe Westlands to someone who's never been to Nairobi? So Westlands is is the upcoming um, upcoming part of the city. We have. Um, with what we call the Wall Street of uh, Nairobi is on Westlands Road, which is the road we are based on, where most of the investment banks are placed in the area. The stock exchange for Nairobi is, is just across us. Mm-hmm. So, so to speak, we are the heart of the financial district of Nairobi. Okay. I think that's the best way to describe um, Westlands mm-hmm. or the location we are in. However, to point out also, it's it's an area which has a lot of, um, it's got a high intensity of restaurants and restaurants, clubs, as well as um, cafes. Mm-hmm. So to, uh, one way is to say that that's competition, but on the other hand, it's to say that there's a lot of spending in the area. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, hence why one of the decisions to choose Westlands as a starting location. Uh, although we would say we are slightly off the heart of Westlands. Um, and initially we were actually looking at a place down the road in the heart of Westlands. Luckily it didn't work out and so we got the space we have now. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the network of roads and all and accessibility has helped us still be in the picture and be considered part of oh, yeah. the main Westlands. And you basically, it's a, how many stories are in this building? So it's an 11 story building. Yeah, and you've basically got the eighth floor. We've got the full eighth floor, yeah. uh, which has got a nice balcony with Nairobi weather made a lot of sense because we have like 11 months of the year where we can actually sit outside mm -hmm. <laughs> and one month of uh, rain that really hinders everything. But apart from that, okay. Yeah, so we chose the we chose the floor with the balcony, and it came to us as a more obvious choice than otherwise. Mm -hmm. And was it completely bare when you got it? Yes, we got a shell. So yeah. um, as and when someone walks into the cafe, we had to construct our um, we had to construct certain walls, the kitchens. Uh, we actually created, we had to create, construct walls inside for our storage and everything. We literally got a square box, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, how did you think about, like, the startup costs of, of doing something like this? Um, so we got big help because um, we, were with, we were involved with someone who is, whose job was to install kitchen equipment into restaurants. One of the six? One of the six. Well, that's very helpful, isn't it? Exactly. So he, that is, and that I would imagine is, was the largest cost for starting off a project like this. So as soon as you understand your largest cost, and it's very simple. That, um, nowadays you have experts in the industry who can give you a rough quote from day one to say, look, if you're looking to do something like this with woodwork and this much cement work and all, it will cost you within a range of X and Y. But if you're looking to do a bit more high end where you want to use tiles and this and this, then your cost will go up to this amount. And yeah, it works with, um, it, it all works with estimated costs and um, mm -hmm. just, and taking it from there. Of course, projections were a lot lower than the end cost that we faced, mm -hmm. but we had a rough idea of how far it would go. Okay. And um, when you were sort of deciding, did you basically say, okay, it's going to take us, it's going to cost X to start it up. Mm -hmm. um, did you sort of factor in how long it might take to pay back? Yes and no. Yes, because like every other business, you want to know in how long the return to a project like this would be. But at the same time, we had accepted that, look, we are diving into this. It can go either way. Mm -hmm. So if you dive in with two feet, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you just accept that perhaps it might not work out. Perhaps it will. They might, we might not hit the targets we want to. Uh, whether the return of investment will be three years, up to even three years, we are very okay with it. Okay. But the more important thing was to set up a well-established, a well running cafe. Mm -hmm. The biggest aim was that once we can do that, once we can control all the loopholes, we know that eventually it will be something that will pay back. Okay. Yeah. So, but again, these are things you'll realize much after you get closer to opening the place as opposed to when you think about the idea itself. Mm, good. And you don't need to go into specifics, but roughly, what's, what was the range you were given? of the upfront capital that it would take to set up a cafe? It was varied, but it can go. Because this space was a lot bigger than what we initially planned as well, or the initial space we were looking at. So we are given quotes from roughly 30 to 60 million shillings easily. Okay, so that's like 300,000 to 600,000 USD? Roughly, yes. Yeah, okay, so it's not rich. So it's, um, it was very varied, again, what you want to do from the place, what, how you want to serve even, like in terms of the glass as well, you go for 
the industrial look with metal glasses will cost you 100 shillings, like a dollar for a glass. Mm -hmm. You go for a nice finished um, branded glass, it can cost you up to seven, eight dollars. Mm. Now, I can't put a budget on that, but I can tell you that there is, it depends on what you want to, yeah. how you want to do it, what you want to do, what's available, what's not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And how did you come through this, the six of you? What, was it sort of one person was responsible for the interior? Um, or if there was any big decisions, you'd have to all six of you do it, or was it a, yeah, you know, so, the process yeah, was? I guess uh, it works. Uh, initially, it, it took all of us. Um, so with any idea, it would take all six of us to pitch in the ideas. Then one person would be allocated to carry it through, mm -hmm. and then make a final uh, up to a final decision. Then present it back to the team and say, "Okay, look, I'm going with this." And generally, there's a good understanding between the six that these are six very able, very capable, very smart individuals. So then you have. To like for me, I know the people I'm, people I'm partners with, they're brilliant people. Mm -hmm. So if they make a judgment, it's not, it's not a rash decision. It's after it, they've given it good thought. Mm -hmm. And having a thought process in mind is how they came up with choice A over choice B and C. Mm -hmm. When we had presented choice A to Z, they filtered out four and from that they chose one. Yeah. So why did they choose that? They would be able to justify it. and. We support that, and that's how decisions were made, and that's how work was carried forward. Mm -hmm. So, if some certain people are in charge of certain decisions, they would filter out, make the decision, present to the team, and say, "Look, I'm going with this. If there's no major objection, let's do it." Okay. And yeah, and then the follow through depends. Were they in charge of the follow through as well, or was another partner in charge of that? Mm -hmm. And that person takes over and supports the decision made by everyone now. Yeah. So the, and so were you like having a weekly meeting for these sorts of things? Or was it just kind of a bit ad hoc? There was, uh, when needed, we'd meet up um, based on the activity or event, but there would be a compulsory, of course, meet, weekly meeting to summarize, to set timelines, to set dates, to set, um, well, just to get ourselves updated on progress and all. Mm -hmm. But during the week, I would perhaps meet with the relevant people, or if we had to meet our contractor, then all six of us would turn up to the place to decide, maybe, because of the pallet furniture we've got involved in the place. Mm -hmm. This was designed specifically for, for us. It's not readily available furniture. Mm -hmm. So even the six of us had to sit down and decide what's going to be the length and the width and the height of that table. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that, you'd sit down and say, look, if you are seated here, if you're a customer, this is how it's going to be, you're playing a board game, is this height okay, is it too low, is it too high? Mm -hmm. So you'd have a practical discussion with a sample or a model and then decide, okay, this works, this doesn't, Yeah. yeah uh, we should go higher in this, lower in this. Sometimes if it comes to it, okay. majority vote, like if yeah. majority decide this is the right height. You take it. Yeah, yeah very good. Um, we've not yet spoken about board games, despite yeah. being a board game cafe. <laughs> um, how, so when you, well, when anyone walks into Battle Box in the, in the centre, is this sort of almost a tower, well, it's this sort of middle shelfing, almost like a tower of, mm -hmm. of board games. Where do you source board, board games from? Um, anywhere and everywhere. We have had limitations in terms of uh, Kenya itself, but there are lots of agents nowadays who do source from everywhere in the world. Okay. And uh, it's it's available for you. Yeah. What was did you have like a minimum number of board games you felt you had to have before you could open the doors? So as opposed to saying we needed a minimum number, what we did is we all did research and shortlisted that look, these are the games we need in our place. Oh. So some of the games are the ones we have played before. Some of them you go through, you go through YouTube, and you oh, go YouTube. through Facebook. You just go look at the games. Are they practical? What's the response of people? Every kind of research is possible. Really? See, so you, you you would you would go on YouTube and you'd watch videos of people playing board games and think, is this the type of game I want in Powerbox? A part of the research, yeah. Oh, wow. that, that, everything uh, yeah. and anything is research. <laughs> yeah. 
that's cool. I, I had no idea that, yeah, I haven't really thought about it actually. Okay. And then there's, so then there's someone's job to go out and say, right, we want to get Connect Four or Cards Against Humanity. Mm-hmm. You, you then just go out and walk, you know, then, go to a few go to shows and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So then we have, um, then we look, then we ask the people who source these things and ask them, listen, these are the games we want. When you say somebody who sources them, that means there's someone who, someone's job. Correct. So there's, is, is there are it, yeah. companies here that are already selling board games in shops. Mm-hmm. So you would ask them, now they wouldn't know, so some of these games cannot do well commercially. So they have never stocked them. Or some of these games have never been heard of in Nairobi, so they wouldn't stock them. Yeah. But then we would request them that, look, we are looking for these games, please um, get them for us. They would have, of course, the links with the international suppliers and all that about the board game, so they would make sure they get it for us. All right, so there are some games in Box that can't be found elsewhere in Kenya? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, really? Do, do you know what any of those are? Well, interesting. Uh, Carcassum is one of them. I have not seen it here before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's La Havre, there's another one that I've not seen here before. There are variations of Jenga which I've not seen in Nairobi before. Okay. Because only the standardized Jenga is common, everyone knows about it, but there are so many variations and twists to the game. Really? So those are difficult to come by because I can imagine even for any commercial you know, uh, toys outlet, they would never know if that would sell or not. Mm. And it, I guess it's, it's one of those games as well, you wouldn't pick it up every day to play. Mm-hmm. So it's one of, you can't, it's not, they're not family friendly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because some of the games are adulterated. So I don't believe many families would buy into that game then in that case. Yeah. So stuff like that, I guess, yeah. yeah. How many board games do you have? It started off with, um, just above 100. Right now we're almost hitting 200 different board games. 200 different board games? Yes. Do you have any repeats? From the 200, no. But we make sure that for every game we have, we have at least two to three copies to allow those many different people to play oh, the same okay. game at the same time. Yeah. Do your board games sit as a asset on your balance sheet? Yes, they do, in a way, yeah. I can't, I can't imagine there are many businesses that have got a line it's, item for, for... Yeah, it's very tricky for even the accountant in a way, because yeah. there's, it's a very unique situation for like, them How well. do you praise a value on exactly. a second-hand board game? And it's not, because it, if you even use it as a raw material for the generating of income, how do you phrase it? Because it is a sitting asset that is generating income. So is it rental income or is it actually... Yeah, do you have to like charge it back to the company or something? Yeah, exactly. It's, got, we're, it's, it's a very tricky situation as well for us. Yeah. I guess that's a problem for the accountant. Yeah, it's not my yeah. problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what's your favourite board game? Good question. It's, it's, it, can't, it can't be just one. But uh, yeah, as soon as I said it, I thought it's like asking what's your favourite book or what's your favourite film, because it depends on the mood. What's exactly, it's, it depends on the mood, who you're with, what do you want to achieve out of it. Okay. Well, what are some things you want to achieve? I, I, I don't want to So agree. let me explain when I say what do you want to achieve out of it. Sometimes um, if I go there with one or two friends, yeah, you want to play, and it's a, it's a Sunday afternoon or something, you don't want to play a drink or drinking oriented game. You want to play something that involves a lot more strategy or thinking, so to speak. So you want to achieve a bit more well, engagement from your brain in a way or engaging yourself, uh, thinking, the thinking aspect of it. So then I would choose a game that is strategically oriented. For a simple example for that would be Monopoly. Okay. But let's say it's a Saturday night, I'm there with some friends, we're having a few drinks, then I'll not go for Monopoly. I would go for something like Jenga or Drink Jenga or Cards Against Humanity, where it, the fun is, or there's a lot more, it's a lot more lighthearted fun, it's a lot easier to play, it doesn't involve your thinking too much. Mm-hmm. And it, it contributes or it's, 
it works well with the noise around you as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it depends on time, day, mood, who you're with. Certain friends would not like to engage in um, games that involve thinking. Then you, even if it's a Sunday afternoon, you'd rather play a little more relaxed, easy-going game. Mm-hmm. Some people enjoy reading rules, making sure they learn a new game. Mm-hmm. So people who are adventurous with board games, then you pick up a game that none of you have played before and try learn the whole game from scratch. Mm-hmm. So even that has its own kind of joy. And sometimes those kind of games become your most favorite game as well for the moment. Yeah. So yeah, it depends what you want to achieve and when. So Thank you. Yeah. And then... Um, when people come to Bar Box, they've got obviously they've got the board games. They can also get a nice drink. They can get some food. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you? What percentage of people are you seeing coming to Bar Box will be playing a game on that visit, or, or will people just be using it as it's like quite a nice space to, to hang out in? So I, I've seen. I can't put percentages on this, but I have seen um, if it's someone after work. They're not coming there for board game. They'll come for a nice drink or a quick meal uh, with their colleagues, and then bam, they're off back home. Mm-hmm. But any other crowd that comes up are generally there to play board games, or rather interact with friends. And the easiest way to do that mostly is board games. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what we have seen. Or we'll find a lot of groups coming in. Part of the group is playing games. The other part just wants to chill and took Mm -hmm. because a lot of places in Nairobi perhaps are not offering that ambience which promotes people to think or promotes people to talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that means, okay, so what what hours of the day is Powerbox open? We open from 7 in the morning till midnight. 7 in the morning? Yes. Really? Yeah, being a cafe and being in um, business central area, it, it helps to be open from 7 in the morning because then at least you do encourage the coffee, uh, the breakfast crowd coming in for a quick coffee, a croissant or something. Mm-hmm. And, and anyway, we have to be there quite early in the morning for mise en place and um, prep, cleaning and everything anyway. So if you are going to be there, might as well open doors and allow people to yeah. come in for a quick fix of a coffee. Okay, great. Okay. So... It seems that, I don't know actually, I'm, I'm kind of wonder whether the utilisation, I'm not sure if utilisation is the right word, but the, the times at which people are coming to Powerbox and engaging, spending money and buying things, whether you have an advantage over a normal, a quote unquote, normal cafe, is the fact that you've got um, the board game attraction, does that mean that you feel more and more people are able to sort of utilise the, the space throughout the day? I would like to believe so. But then again, we are never, or we aren't the biggest cafe in Nairobi, or the busiest cafe, or, or the biggest, busiest restaurant as well. Mm. I think as long as you give people a unique experience, or a different experience, or rather even a good experience, you're going to get a crowd. Mm. Because you can't do... You can't do board games every day. The same way you cannot eat Italian every day. You'd want to change. Mm-hmm. So I cannot say that this, the, I am. Uh, board games is what's making me better than others. But at the same time, we have good Italian restaurants in Nairobi that. But, but people, I don't think, would go for an Italian restaurant at 4 p.m. Whereas they might come to Bow Box. If they have a nice bar, people just want to relax. They want ambience. They want service. They're, as long as they get that, okay. I I don't have a I don't have the biggest after work crowd as well. Mm-hmm. The other places uh, which definitely pull a bigger crowd than us, I guess as long as you provide what people are looking for, then that crowd will come to you. Okay. Is um does do people have to be over the age of eighteen to come into that box? No, it's board games. Board games. But it's, like, of, it's not like a, a licensed premises or there's no for example in some countries well like in the UK at least I think if you go to a particular bar they will say because they serve alcohol there 
you, you won't be allowed in because of that, is that a thing? Uh, no, there's a bigger responsibility on us as Baobox to ensure that we are not serving minors drinks. Okay. But here, generally, most cafes, bars and all operate uh, with bar, food and cafe. So on that basis, it's some, there is something they have for people of all ages. Mm -hmm. There is no legislation here that if you're serving alcohol, you can't have minors in the premises. But if in your premises you are caught serving a minor alcohol, then it's a problem. Yeah. So for us, it's a bigger responsibility. And um, if we have any doubt on someone not looking the right age, to approach them and tell them, do not, that we'll have to ask for an ID from you to confirm your age. And if you cannot present it, then unfortunately we cannot serve you any alcoholic drink. Yeah. So we make sure that we don't, um, we do not serve alcohol, or if you're unsure, we make sure that it, um, this information has been conveyed and the customer has been able to provide proof. Then only we move forward, otherwise the managers have been strictly kind yeah. of, yeah. There's no two ways about it. Um, why is it called Bao Box? So Bao is um, a traditional Swahili game, a board game, more formally known as Mankala in the rest of the world. And um, being a board game cafe in Kenya, and we could have called it all kinds of weird names or different names, but then we thought a sense of um, originality and a touch of the local aspect had to be there. And Bao is a game we have played as well many times growing up. And uh, so we thought, how else can you link uh, what we have, something brilliant that is this Kenyan culture and touch with us and incorporate it in our name. Mm. Hence, we had to ensure Bao had to appear in the name yeah. to make sure that the local board game has been um, taken into account or given its respect in a way. Yeah, okay. Um, what, what was the second choice? We had come up with some very funny names. One was the social box. Because, um, you see, in, in essence, I think what we were looking at is more than just saying it's a business which is which is going to attract people by having board games and food and drinks. It was more of us. Uh, the whole idea revolved, started with the board games and the cafe was built around it. Mm -hmm. To say that, no, the core of the business was board games. And why board games? Because we believe that we wanted to promote and encourage um, this social socializing and bonding which existed, uh, um, which existed 10, 15 years ago. But at that time, it wasn't something that had to be pushed or encouraged. It was such a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Now, to bring back such kind of nostalgic um, um, so socializing, nostalgic feeling, board games. Okay. So every other name we thought of was linking to that. Understood. Okay. Yeah, so it was, we went quite far, came back um, and settled with Powerbox for that reason that we can't, as much as we'd like to use all these different puns around the world and all that regarding board games and this and that, but it made more sense just to simply go with a board game we all know and a board game we all relate to and a board game that is very Kenyan, very us. Yeah. And that's why, yeah, bar box. Yeah. Very cool. Right. Um, so we'll just do a few more questions. Um, sure. Sorry. Well, I'm interested, um, so what have been some of the, so the, the inception for bar box came just over two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what have been, if you sort of compare today with two and a bit years ago, what have been some of the surprises? Or, yeah, what have been some of the surprises that have, um, that have happened? Good surprises, bad surprises. We'll go with either. <laughs> <laughs> Start with the bad, I guess. Um, again, not being from the industry uh, gave us surprises or gave us challenges that we did not foresee or we did not think would have been a problem. Um, so service is one of them, always trying to ensure that we are giving top-notch service. We are ensuring that Board games itself, we have a lot of people taking souvenirs from the board games. Really? So people will like steal a piece of 
Yeah, so we don't know why, but uh, when they do, unfortunately what it does is, is it, it breaks or it spoils the experience for the next person yeah. who picks up the game. And so many of these board games, you take one piece away, Can the, yeah, the whole game is ruined. Mm. So those are the kind of challenges we did not expect it to be at the scale it was. How do you stop you, those, that you can't, that? I don't know if you can. Do you have to have a bouncer? To start like, <laughs> <laughs> got no yeah, uh, his job would be very interesting. Because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these pieces are quite small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the only way to um, prevent, I guess, is it's difficult to control and prevent the stealing or the when I guess yeah, the people taking souvenirs. I don't like to use the word stealing, but <laughs> but any, yeah, they, yeah. So the only way to curb it is look at the bigger picture that you don't want to spoil the experience for any other customer who comes in. They don't want to know why someone else took a piece. They would want to understand that. So just to make sure we have enough buffer stock for the games, we have to ensure that we have a regular audit of the games going on. Mm -hmm. So my mornings, uh, the, the staff team that comes in in the morning, they do their cleaning duties. And their, their reason plus for the day is actually to ensure they can go through as many board games as they can and check if everything is in order. No way. So yeah. you, you've got like a little list of, in Monopoly, we need to make sure that all these cards exist. Correct. Really? Yes. It really helps as well. So being in Kenya, unfortunately, and um, well, rather fortunately being in Kenya, but unfortunately with the staff we get here, they have not been exposed to board games before. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to being in the UK or Canada, perhaps where they have the largest board game cafe in the world, they would have access to people who can be naturally considered to be game masters. Mm -hmm. Here we didn't have this luxury and a lot of my staff, the first time they've ever played a board game was at Bowerbox. Yeah, right. yeah, so it's really cool. Some of them are very excited as well. Um, a couple of my staff are actually, they know how to play roughly 80 to 90 games now, which is impressive because I am learning games from them now. Yeah. And so it works two ways as well. For us, it's nice that we gave our staff a chance to experience this whole wave of culture that to them was completely new. It's, again, being a low-income economy, you have people who have uh, waiter jobs here are not fillers for students and all. It is more of a lifetime career for many of my mm. staff. They've been doing it for 10, 15 years. And this is it for them. They're trying to grow in this field as much as they can. But that's... Um, so the, prob the, the problem is because of their background, they've not been exposed to this. So we feel that perhaps it's never too late. So we give them a chance. It really is, is that part of people's schedule almost is if they've got some downtime they're kind of expected to play board games well, well expected that sounds a bit harsh but you know yeah. what I mean like, so right um, so you, before yeah. we, uh, earlier when we met today uh, I don't know if you noticed because we were not too busy and I had a big team of staff I had my manager I, did, I see I, yeah, I did exactly. notice I thought they were having like a team meeting but they were just now playing exactly. what, what were they playing a car cousin actually yeah, yeah. Uh, the one which can be found nowhere else yeah, yeah. <laughs> And yeah, so they were playing that game because all the staff were not needed on service. Mm. And to me, I would like them to learn the game as well because it provides me an added benefit as opposed to getting someone else from outside to check on the games. My own staff can look after the games. They can know when something is missing, something is damaged. Mm -hmm. Because if they have played the game, they know what's needed in it. Mm. And at the same time, to me, another aspect that I get covered when I teach them board games is that they can give my customers a better experience as well. Mm. So when someone knows roughly 80 to 90 board games, they can teach a customer who walks in a game they've never played before. Mm -hmm. So that itself really is really helpful for us as well because we tell customers that, look, here we have very capable staff who are going to teach you a game you've not played before to give you a different experience in your evening tonight. Mm. And that can allow us to take a step back and it's as opposed to going, as opposed to different customers waiting for one of us to go teach games to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's uh, killing like three birds with one stone now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, and what, what's been like a, a positive surprise 
Or another, pro- another positive yeah, surprise? Yeah, a positive surprise would be um, how much people have um, been wanting to do things like this. So this is not just board games. I'm talking Nairobi in general. There's a lot of places that different experiences have been created. Um, like, what's the name for Like mystery rooms. Oh, yeah. Um, escape rooms. Escape rooms, yeah. yeah. So a lot of people have... Um, I think there are two companies that actually set up escape rooms in Nairobi as well. So that means that people are looking for new experiences. There is a bowling alley that reopened in Nairobi again, and it's been quite busy. So again, it's just that generally it's a good surprise to see that people actually were not happy with just the option of food and drinks. They wanted more from it. It's just that the market was not giving it to them. And now when all these places are coming up, it's good to see that people are exploring and making the most of them. Because otherwise the go-to place would always be clubbing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, with the go-to place being clubbing, it doesn't... In the long run, I feel that that generation that comes through clubbing will not be uh, challenged very differently. Or their thinking will be very monotonous over a long period of time. But when people go out for new experiences is when they start growing and they start seeing the world differently. Mm-hmm. We have a zip lining place that's opened up in Nairobi, uh, an hour drive from Nairobi as well. Accessible, professionally run experience. Mm. So I think that all contributes to create, allowing Nairobi to create a culture for people who want more out of their time out. Or yeah, the, the experience economy, is that what they call it? You know, yeah. people less, exactly. they less want to buy stuff, they want to experiences. Yeah. So I guess a lot of people, when we came back to Nairobi as well, like we had a, good, um, we had a lot of friends who had left back in the UK. And um, people from Kenya as well, and they would always say that even Nairobi is very dull. In Nairobi, what the only thing going for us was being a small city, everything was accessible. Mm-hmm. So what was the everything that was our friends? So there'd be a lot of opportunities to meet up friends very easily. I don't have to plan. Like To me, London is a good example because I've been there, I've visited, and I can tell you, like, People working in London had to plan that after work we'll meet in the city and then you go your way, I'll go my way. In Nairobi I could go to work, get home, have dinner and then plan to meet up with friends. Mm. And still be home at a good time to get a good night's sleep and be back to work the next day because everything was accessible. Whereas in London what they were enjoying was when they do meet up there's a lot more for them to do. Mm. They don't have to repeat the same activity again, while they can still get a bite to eat, they can get a drink. So I think Nairobi was missing that and that is a good surprise to see that as opposed to looking at other entertainment places as competition, it's to to say that look, together we are all responsible for creating a culture Mm. and that culture itself will change a generation which will be so used to just being out and about and getting more from their evening or Day, basically. Fantastic. Um, so, so it, people listening at home, how can they learn more about Bowbox? Um, maybe perhaps, to, yeah. So, we have a website, uh, www.bowbox.co.ke. Mm-hmm. We have a Facebook page, uh, Bowbox Cafe. We have a Instagram page as well. The best sources, I guess, to just get a brief on what we're up to. Um, who we who we are in a way, and what I normally say is the best place because what we are doing with Powerbox, being a passion project with friends, we are always trying to create events that we would personally enjoy. Mm-hmm. So if people want to try a different experience um, from a night out or an evening, um, we have random events coming up which have been very varied to what you see in Nairobi normally, uh, but just things because. These are events we are creating because of, of the fun of it more than what is the return if I do this and the time <laughs> I spend on it. Um, for that reason, like recently we had a dirty bingo night. Dirty bingo night. Exactly. What is dirty bingo? It, see, that's the brilliant, good question. It's bingo <laughs> yeah. for adults. Okay. <laughs> so, dirty bingo. Okay. Yes, and yes, that night we had to have an um, um, age limit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, it has been go played with dirty words, but it is absolutely brilliant. It's just funny, like you know, when when someone can comfortably shout out those dirty words <laughs> because it's part of a game, <laughs> creates a very different atmosphere in a place. Recently, we had um, Start Stop Night, um, I, probably known as Animal Kingdom A to Z in okay. different parts of the world. We put a twist to it to allow it to be a group game, and that's about it. But like, these are games people haven't played for years since childhood. Just getting a piece of paper back in the day it was simple: getting a piece of paper, writing name, place, animal, thing, mm -hmm. and someone chooses a letter, and you start filling it in. Yeah. Here we created a twist to it and all, but more importantly, it was a way for us to take people back in time mm -hmm. and to get them to start thinking about those memories again and that's what we're trying to do again and again. Fantastic. So hopefully, yeah, it's, um, we're hoping more and more people would, um, would buy into more of what we are trying to achieve more than just say, come play board games. Yeah, very cool. Well, I'll, I'll link to all of those in the show notes as well as um, a link to, to where the cafe is. So if anyone's in Nairobi, mm -hmm. they can come see. Thank you, um, I appreciate it. But yeah, Sumit, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ben. I uh, appreciate this. <laughs> Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see show notes for this episode by heading to the new website, www.theeastafricabusinesspodcast.com. If you'd like to learn more about the show and the work we do, then you can have a bit of an explore on the website and also subscribe to the various places such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and email. Finally, if you felt this was a good episode and you've been enjoying the show recently, then please do consider leaving a rating for the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen. You could also tell a friend who's curious about these sorts of businesses that we feature. And indeed, if you know of a business that you'd like to be interviewed on the show, please feel free to reach out via any of the channels mentioned above and we'll see what we can do to have an interview and showcase them on the show. In any case, have a great week and speak to you soon.